thank you. Really appreciate uh, the invitation to be here. It's kind of exciting. Thank Howard County Historical Society for making us, making this happen. And if anybody can't hear us, if we're speaking too softly, which is so unlike us, um, <laughs> please, please raise your hand. Let us know. And Sneed, Nate, you should introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Nate. I'm the uh, Wayne's son. I know, it's hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not just the hands, the whole. I think this was even your shirt from when you were 30 years ago. Um, but yeah, so I used to work down at the B&O you know, Ellicott City Station Museum, and now I'm at the Fire Museum of Maryland in Lutherville. Um, and they, it's funny, even when I go there, they have an, I was just telling Mark, they have a, uh, I think it's a 48 or 49, uh, 1949, uh, American La France Elegant City engine, fire engine. Uh, it's not running yet, but I'd like to maybe someday get it down here. You know, but. Um, Is that the one from Elegant City? Or that was a different one? I don't know. I think that one might belong to the fire department here. Oh, okay. I don't know. Got to ask around. Um, anyway, you yeah, know, we. What we like to do, instead of sitting up here and telling you and showing you everything we learned and going point by point through a book, um, just to have a little bit of a discussion, let you know what our thought process was, um, how we interacted as a father-son team to try to do this, some of the challenges that we faced, our favorite parts of this, and then, um, you know, to oh, oh, also let you know what we're up to next uh, for a second book, but we can't can't say too much yet. Um, and that that's kind of the way that we we do this here. So, um, and then we'll take lots of questions if anybody has questions afterwards. Um, so we often get asked, how do we get to write this book? Hidden History of Howard County, why is it called Hidden History of Howard County, who's the publisher and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, it, it kind of started basically in January of 2017, as far as I can go back to my email records, and uh, just was walking along the pathways, uh, living in Columbia, there's wonderful pathways, and an area that I've been by dozens and dozens of times, I just stopped walking a little slower, and I uh, needed some back surgery, so I'm, I'm looking at the stones in these big piles, and I noticed that some of them had rough, squared edges. Hmm. They, I was like, wait, that's not natural. And I took a closer look, and some of them had holes in them. And, you know, while I knew, and we both knew that there was a quarry on the other side of the river, uh, this is uh, off of Guilford Road near the Guilford Pratt Bridge. Um, and, you know, I just had no idea why were these stones on my side of the river. I mean, it just made no sense. There were no, no quarries there, etc. So I contacted uh, Howard County Record Parks, Clara Gouin. Uh, she had done some remarkable research, and she was the one responsible for putting up the interpretive history signage on that Pratt Bridge. And she told me what she could, but she said, you really need to talk to Jerry Eucherman, who's here, because Jerry was researching at the same time, had contacted her basically at the same time, researching the old Guilford Mill. And so we started comparing notes, oh, getting out, uh, it, it, it was really started this effort that um, was was a pretty cool one to try to explain all these things that we didn't know. And of course, then it you know talking to Nate about it because this guy was a, is a was a history major from UMBC, and as any parent, when your kid tells you they want to be a history major, <laughs> what are okay. you teach? Yeah, I mean. Well, all I got the whole time. Not, not, not just for me, but from everybody that I told. But yeah, history majors. Oh, you're going to be a teacher then. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and I'm coming from 
a government science background. And I'm thinking, well, it's just like with my field, you know, you research, you know the stuff, you do, it's all documented in journals, isn't that the way it is for history? I said, what are you gonna do? What are you gonna, what are you gonna study? Uh, everybody knows everything about history. And I was like, oh boy. I had no clue uh, what I was getting into. And then the stories about your childhood, walking and looking at these areas, yeah. And on the bridge. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was interesting going back and looking at it uh, when I was 25 or something, but it was 20 years before that. There was this spot in this, what I didn't know when I was three or four years old, it was an outcropping of granite. Uh, but we'd go back and look through it, and I'm like, oh, there's, there's where my telephone booth was. And I was about that tall. And, you know, but I remember when I was about three feet tall, going up to it and pretending it was my little telephone booth, um, which you can't, speaking of historic artifacts, um, telephone booths, but, um, but yeah, and, and then going to the, to the bridge we were mentioning, um, climbing, you know, walking across that before they redone the surface of it in 2002? Somewhere around there. One or two. Um, so there's this old Pratt Through Trust bridge that was not safe for it nine or ten year old to climb on but I'm the youngest of three and was swayed by my older siblings to go ahead and try to climb it and try to cross it. Um, it's only a 25 foot drop to the water. Um, we obviously didn't tell uh, our parents but that kind of stuff came out later when we, when we started actually researching it like oh what is this place? Oh what was this place? Like? What would it have looked like without this you know the CA pack that's there now um, and the redone everything. On the, on the surface level, I was like, oh, I actually saw it once when it was, you know, and then went across it. Yeah, I actually found a picture that we took yeah. um, before it was completed. Um, <coughs> kids weren't in it, I think, but we, we did find one that, that uh, we took years and years ago. So on that side of the river happened to be uh, Howard Granite Company quarries. We had no idea. <coughs> that they were there. So our research led us to that, um, found that the Columbia Association filled in one of the quarries and put, <clears throat> put a pathway over it. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Um, and, you know, just started to learn, well, you know, the quarries over there, the one thing we knew is that granite's heavy, you know. <laughs> They don't want to move it any more than they needed to. And so why is a quarry there? How did they do all this stuff? And the more we, we looked into it, we learned about the Patuxent Branch Railroad line and how it went from Guilford all the way down to Savage. Uh, past Winkovin Trail, went down on the Green Trail of Winkovin over the middle Patuxent River and into Savage, and that was an extension done in 1902. But what was really cool I didn't realize until I saw Interstate Commerce Commission maps was that there was a spur line coming off right before you got to the bridge, coming off down what was now this Columbia Association trail, all the way down to where those Howard Granite Company quarries were. And it was like, oh man, that's, I, that's really cool. You know, so it just started our whole, whole effort. Um, you know, we, we started, you know, you know, Jerry found uh, where the cemetery was located, right across the street, and found it on a plat. And said, hey, you know, let's go look at it. And that was a whole other adventure and, and that's included in the book, um, uh, uh, pre-Civil War cemetery. Uh, it just was really interesting, but I, I don't want to tell you all the all the details because there's not enough time in the year uh, to go into all of that. And you know, right now, just did a lot of Facebook posts. Facebook posts became a website, mm -hmm. and. 
one of my colleagues and friends, uh, you know, so why don't you do a book? Everybody's doing a book. It's like, okay, well, we, you know, thought about doing a book on it. Um, and, so well, I'll back up. I, well, actually, I want to fast forward just to let you know that that whole Patuxent Branch Trail area, the uh, Reckon Parks and the county has proposed to do their second historic park. And they're going to call it the B&O, Patuxent Branch Historic Park. And that goes between Guilford, that Guilford Bridge and Savage. I mean, this is what they say, uh, you know, I've taken them at their word, uh, hopefully they're gonna follow through. And, and so something good and something interesting um, and tangible can come as a result of all the, you know, the research that, that you do. Um, so Nate, yeah, why didn't we? Because uh, we went to them pretty early on, talked to Claire, yeah. and then I remember in like 2000, was this 18? We met with uh, several of the members of Wreck and Parks, uh, I guess administration, and CA, with the, we, what we were calling Between the Bridges, um, that was kind of the name that everybody was saying. Um, and that didn't really go anywhere for a few years. And it's only really more recently that it is. COVID hit. Co yeah, that COVID was a big that was, you know, People didn't want to have meetings, and that was kind of, you know, I don't know, all the colleagues that I had before, you know, I, you know, after I retired, they were all meeting every day. I mean, they were doing things on Zoom, they were doing whatever, but uh, I guess, well, some people didn't want to use Zoom as much and, you know, probably shifting finances and grants and all this kind of stuff. And that was another major impetus for continuing and building up a lot of this work was my dad retired. Uh, and never seen him happier. <laughs> um, but it, you know, it, it freed up a lot of time. It, it, it gave him, you know, just freedom in general. Um, so if anybody's not retired, I recommend it. <laughs> not from personal experience, but from his. I hope, he's, I don't know if anybody in my generation is going to be able to retire, but that's a separate conversation. Yeah, that's, yeah. Uh, but um, that really pushed forth the effort. And then I started working because of meeting with the county people, you know, my dad being my dad, and you know, first a dad, then researcher, et cetera. Uh, he asked the person who was in charge of what was at the time the Living History and Heritage section, hey, do you have any job openings? My son, I wasn't working at the time, um, and she said, well, we are looking, you know, we did just have a couple people leave from the LA City Station, and, um, you know, and so I interviewed, got the job, um, and was there until two weeks ago. Yeah, it was a contingent job which meant not permanent, uh, with no benefits. So of course, as a parent, you do want your kid to come on, you gotta get those benefits. And, and, and that gave us, though, that gave kind of me a lot more of like, oh, now I can, you know, do this as part of my job too, not just on the side or in the afternoon, but like as a part of this effort. So I kind of saw the inside scoop on what was going on with a few things. and. It was really interesting to see just how much people did or didn't know about what we were trying to do or what we were even talking about. Um, but yeah, and that happened, that was like 2019. I remember, uh, as a quick aside, yeah. I remember the morning you retired, or the morning after you retired, I took a picture of him and me and I said, look at the freeloader sitting eating breakfast. Because <laughs> then I was the only one with the job. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So, so that, that's how we started all of this. And our focus of the book, we wanted to write a, a book about Guilford and Savage area and that part. And not just because of what we found in that little local area, but the more I researched it, you know, Christ Church from uh, at least by, uh, that's on Oakland Mills Road, for those of you that may not be familiar. Yeah, Oakland Mills um, and Dobbin. By uh, 1711, they had built another structure. There was one before that. And that was the center of Howard County society. 
That is where everybody went. That is where you paid your taxes. That is, um, you know, that was an incredible center. Uh, so we wanted to continue to look into that. We went to a, a publisher. And, you know, how do you select a publisher? Well, you, you take a look on the shelf over here and, and you see how many books are by Arcadia yeah. and uh, the History Press. And they look good and, and, and you know, and we talked with a few authors and they said they had good experience. So, hey, let's make a, a proposal to Arcadia Publishers about this book. And they basically uh, said, no, <laughs> it's, it's too narrow. Nobody knows yeah. where Guilford is. Yeah. Nobody knows, you know, Guilford Savage. It's, that's, and we were like, that's the point. That's why it's hidden history. <laughs> Nobody knows. Yeah, so they wanted us to broaden it and they, uh, to take Guilford out of the title. And that was a, a whole nother half a year effort. Because we, we already had a lot of information on Ellicott City. Ellicott City's yeah. been researched um, quite a lot. We didn't want to just, you know, add on to, well, not even add on, just to repeat. Uh, it really deserved its own research effort. And at the same time, um, you may or may not know, um, I was already working with, um, a group to do early Ellicott City Black History. I was, and and I, I did not want to mix these two efforts. Um, I wanted to honor, I didn't want to use any of the information that I was learning um, through this nonprofit. And, uh, you know, so we, we broadened it. We looked at Howard County in general. I mean, we wrote a little bit about Ellicott City. Uh, some of the stories that you hear about the Ellicott brothers is that they built this mill and, you know, or that all of a sudden everything happened in 1772. Well, you know, it was at the end of 1772. Things didn't really start going until 1774. And, uh, and no, you know, one of the, the stories is that there was this mill act uh, in Maryland that encouraged, uh, they wanted to encourage Milling, grist mills. Um, they, they wanted to encourage this, and so they had this thing where if you bought some land to do a mill, you were granted property on either side of that, um, uh, any, uh, either side of that river, and then downstream a bit. And they were really, you know, they're, they're really gracious with this, and they wanted to push it, and they wanted to encourage mills. Well, by the time the Ellicott brothers got here, that had already been, uh, the Mill Act was already uh, voided uh, because people were getting too upset about their land being taken because somebody wanted to build a mill. Uh, so that really didn't happen. They, they first bought in Baltimore County and then in uh, 1774 they bought land out here in Howard County. But you could read a lot about that all throughout this museum here. It's, it's a pretty cool, a uh, very interesting history, but it's history that more people were familiar with. So the topics that we chose were things that we didn't <coughs> think people knew that much about or didn't hear about. Um, yeah, one of the first things that we, I did as a history major in school, I'm sure my dad did in, in science, uh, was a literature review. Uh -huh. well, who's already written what and what do they say? And when it comes to the Guilford area, it's like nothing. It wasn't much. Uh, um, here or there. And there was a booklet about Savage by uh, Vera Ruth Philby. And some of it, I mean, it was really good, really done. It was done in 1965. She was with National Security Ag Agency. Her husband, I um, can't remember his name, he was with the Maryland Historical Society, um, and it, it was a pretty well documented book, but some things didn't make sense. But for research done in 1965, with the tools that they had available, that, that was really, really good. And we always have to keep that in mind that 
everybody didn't, you know, the internet wasn't around in, in the 60s or 70s or 80s. You couldn't just do research. And it's only been in the last, what, 10, 15 years that they're putting collections online. Yeah. yeah. Um, they weren't always online. And, and thankfully, they're putting those collections up because, you know, basically, you know, they're, you know, I do know people that spend all day and day and day and week at the uh, Maryland Archives in Annapolis, at the State Archives. But, you know, that, that's not who I am. I like to play on the computer and, you know, try to do research. And then if I find a lead, I'll go and try to follow it up. But, you know, what you're mentioning, by, so the literature review, it's different, I think, when you're writing about history than when you're writing about science. I was, I did literature reviews, you know, since, since the early 80s. Uh, you know, I had to do that for my master's thesis, that's what you did. You, but it, it's, the information is open to less necessarily, less interpretation. You're looking at data, you're looking at what somebody published, you're looking at, you know, you have an idea, you have a hypothesis for your thesis. And you're trying to find evidence and data to support what you're thinking. That's kind of how that science process works. Well, for history and many other things, it's, it's almost you know, the opposite in many ways. You don't want to let your theory that you have or hypothesis drive what you're, you know, drive the data, drive the evidence. You want to look at what that evidence is and then formulate the story. Uh, it's the only way to know whether or not it's true or not. We have so many different historical narratives uh, propagated time and time again. And people will look at a little thread. You know, one, one example is, is Harriet Tubman. You know, uh, right here. Oh, nice. Okay. Um, who, who, so, very much such a heroic and incredible figure. <coughs> very well documented figure. Yes, a very well documented figure. And also documented the impossibility of ever having been in, in Howard County. Doing things. I mean, you know, maybe she took a train through Baltimore, you know, down into Washington uh, during, uh, for uh, the Civil War. But, you know, there's no evidence whatsoever that she was ever in Howard County freeing enslaved people. Yet that myth has been propagated for 30 years or more. And I just noticed it again in the official visitor guide for 2024. Um, it's really uh, downplayed, but it does say, you know, after learning Harriet's story, set out, you should set out to see the sites along the Underground Railroad in the Network to Freedom, including Locust Cemetery, where Harriet Tubman hid alongside escaped slaves in Freetown Road, etc. Uh, you know, she, she, she didn't. Locust Cemetery didn't exist during that <laughs> time period. The church didn't exist yet. That was all after the Civil War. Um, her, her, her travels have been very, very well documented. And uh, no, and I'm sorry, she just wasn't in here. Yet, this myth persists, no matter what we try to do. Uh, so. Evidence is, is a very, very critical thing. And Nate had to help me learn. Um, and the, the head of the nonprofit that did this book, Marlena Giroux, hammered it into me that you can't let your theory drive the evidence. You have to find the evidence to see does this make sense? Is, is this well? And what is, 
What kind of evidence? Primary sources. Yeah. You, you always got to go back to the primary sources. I, I feel that's what I learned in school. Um, and, you know, one of the things, one thing that you don't have, so my dad worked towards the end of his career on uh, toxic releases into streams. And, you know, when you have a monitor that says this amount of this pollutant is released into the water, generally, unless there's something wrong with the monitor or it's going to report the, the truth, the fact. But when you have something written in 1830 about uh, anything really, I mean, it, it's all up to interpretation. <coughs> Little words can be up to interpretation. Um, it's something that you know, we were aware of in Rector Parks at the d &O Station Museum. Um, there's a line that says that the opening room when you walk in the museum after the gift shop was uh, it's the living quarters. But there's no evidence that there was ever anybody living there. Mm -hmm. um, there's just people 30 years ago decided that, well, they read in a B&O Minutes that this one station agent was granted use of the warehouse free of rent. And I guess in just our modern day way of looking at it, free of rent, okay, so he's renting it, so he's gotta be living there. And, and that's, you know, I'm not comfortable making that, uh, that leap there. That, okay, well, he was using it free of rent, but there's another practice um, that lasted until the 1850s that station agents in the B&O could um, use, that, use cars that are parked on the track for their own business, for their own side stuff. Um, and I was like, I said to my, my boss at the time, I said, well, maybe that's what he was using it for. And she said, well, that seems like a leap, too. I was like, yeah, fair point. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, you're always trying to fill in, you know, fill, fill in these stories with real hard evidence, whether that evidence comes from actual letters that were written back in the day, uh, wills, deeds, um, you know, census records, uh, they're not perfect. A lot of mistakes in the census records. But, you know, when you put all these multiple clues together, multiple lines of evidence, then you can have a much greater certainty that your story is valid. Uh, but history has interpretation. And that, you know, that was a, a huge challenge. It's a huge challenge to find all of these primary sources. Um, that was the hardest part of, of this book, I think. The stories are out there, things are out there. You can walk. You know, history is hidden all around us. It's, it's hidden behind corners, it's hidden under water, it's hidden behind developments. Um, sometimes it's, it's just hidden. Documents don't exist or they're not found or they're not located. Something wasn't written down. I said, well, I wasn't, why well, can't we find where this would have been written down? Actually speaking, if I got to make it to the archives. Yeah. <laughs> Question for that. Um, so, you know, trying to figure out and back up a story, um, there's, there's, there's a book on the b &O Railroad uh, by Diltz. Like, what, I yeah, remember. James Diltz. James Diltz. It's a green cover. It's like the Great Road is what it's called. It documents it from 1827 uh, when they started in Baltimore until they reached Wheeling, West Virginia in 1853. Um, and there's a line in that book that has been quoted by a lot of different people. Uh, I come across these articles because at the, at working at the B&O, being in the county, we're very aware of how things are, are perceived. Uh, we want to find out if there was any slave labor that was used in constructing the building. Because if so, that's something that we need to know and, and make, be aware of and make people aware of. And we haven't found anything. I, had, I did not find anything while I was there, and nor did any of my colleagues. Um, what we did find was people referencing that the B&O used slaves to build the railroad. I looked at the, uh, you go to the end, and it's got that little number footnote, you go to the end of the footnote, and it says James Diltz, page 394, in a note. So I was like, all right, let me, I had the James Diltz book, let me open that up. James Diltz, page 394, the B&O used slaves, no, notes, all right, page 590, whatever. Go to the back of his book, find the note, an undated, untitled, 
unspecified document in an unknown place. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it says as a yeah. And this has been being quoted by people across the country who are, are writing about um, antebellum railroads and slave labor, and there's no evidence for it. There's no backing that up. And that's the kind of stuff that we wanted to avoid. Right. Yeah, so that, that's a good example. However, that book is an amazing book. Yeah, <laughs> aside from that. That was the one, that, that, that was just, a, that was an anomaly. That book is well cited and has provided a lot of insight um, for me as we work on our second book. Um, and that's, that's something that is not official. Uh, we're engaged in research, uh, lots of different things. Some of it has to do with the railroad because in Howard County you can't avoid history being affiliated with the railroad in one way or another. Hmm. It was a B&O railroad. Towns named after it, you know. Two, uh, of the, two of the county's borders are formed from the railroad, or the river, but the river runs along. Right. Railroad runs along the river <clears throat> here, and then there's the Washington branch that kind of splits it from right. Randall County. Hmm. So we, we did our best to find primary sources, which is why we have 500 and... 464? 453, maybe? Then numbers. <laughs> Um, we want people to look at this. We want people to to verify. Um, pardon? 454. 454. Um, now we could have used up some of that. We could have used up a lot of that space to tell more stories yeah. and have less documentation. When you when you go to a publisher like this, you, you notice that all oh, the books are around the same size. There's a limit. We were given a limit of 50,000 words and somewhere between 60 and 90 images. It was in a contract. We agreed to that contract after they, after, you know, we negotiated with, with all these different things. Um, it, uh, by the way, you don't make much money. Don't, uh, don't become an author. It is not, it is not one of those things. Um, you do it because you love doing it and, and it keeps you busy and things like that. And at events like this where we get to talk about it and share it and share the experience right. with everybody. So 50,000 words. Well, we already had about 80,000. <laughs> it was like, okay. Uh, we had to go through and cut out a lot. Um, some of it was easy. We cut out entire subjects, let's say. Uh, things that could appear in another book later. If it, if it, a lot of times if it was like a, a one-off thing that didn't really have any connection to the rest of the book, like just a, a really cool story that went on for a few pages, but there was nothing that had to do with the theme of hidden history, uh, the, the other subjects in the book, we took that out as well. It, it, hidden history was an entire series that Arcadia Publishing, the history mm -hmm. press had. They had books called Human History of whatever. They had nothing for Maryland. They did not have any hidden history books for Maryland. Uh, so we, you know, we, we, we filled that one niche. Um, unfortunately, we were also told, you can't do a second hidden history book. You know, they don't do part twos. But they do have the, they do have a series called Lost. <laughs> okay, they said a lot of hidden history authors will go to Lost as the next one. So it's kind of like Lost Towns and Industries uh, of Howard County. That, that sounded like a, a, a fairly good one. Um, and, and they said, well, whenever you're ready to, to contact us, because they were happy with how things turned out, and, uh, you know, so, we're collecting all that information. Um, but, yes. So that was the difficult part, was the documentation. Um, yeah. You know, for me, trained in science, to have to undo my thinking, my biased thinking, um, I, I, really, I really had to think in the way 
of not, not just telling a story because I was all about data. And we, I published, you know, 50 papers. Uh, that, that, that's just what you did. Um, a lot of them were government peer-reviewed uh, reports. And I'll, I'll tell you, in my time publishing, people wanted to knock you off that little whatever you were. There was a lot of competition, awful lot of competition, because other people either wanted your funding, wanted that promotion that you were after, or, or whatever. And, and they, they were shameless. I mean, yeah, you had a lot of friends and colleagues that supported you, but there was also people out there that just digging at every little citation. Did you make a mistake? Did you make a mistake? So anyway, that kind of carried over, but I had to learn about the importance, as you've told me so many times, of telling the story. But we want to tell the stories backed up by the evidence and backed up by the data. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we, we found so many exciting things. You know, I mean, one of my favorite things is that murder mystery um, from 1922 uh, that happened in Guilford. Boy, that was all in the newspapers back then. I got so many different articles about it. Um, and researching newspapers is a whole another topic in of itself. Um, you know, whatever, whatever we research, you, you got to do it again a couple months later. You got to do that same search again, and different things are going to show up. Either, uh, you know, the algorithms have changed a little bit, or there's new information out there. I, I've, every so often, every half year or year, depending upon how long you, you all want to do it, you know, um, search the same things again. And that, that murder mystery, I'd still like to find out who did it. Um, we really don't know. But it's, it's spoiler. Yeah, it's in the book. Yeah, I shouldn't have said we don't know. But um, no, they, they, they've got somebody that was guilty. You know, of course, it was centered around an affair. It was a missing weapon, a murder weapon, that they found in a quarry that was right off of the Little Patuxent River. So Guilford and Waltersville quarry. They drained it, found it in the mud, confirmed the ownership. Um, somebody found out about the affair and had threatened to tell her husband that she was having an affair with a divorced man. And that was like a no-no. And, and all of this happened along Guilford Road, basically, between Guilford and Savage. Um, just a fascinating story. He was found guilty. He wouldn't testify against her. Uh, he was still in love with her. And uh, her trial, she was let go. She never had a trial because he was the key witness. And he refused to testify against her. Um, I know. He said she did it. She said he did it. Um, all we know is that she was the only one that had ever fired a weapon at this guy. And that kind of swayed me, but you got to read the story and tell me who do you think did it? Did he do it or did she do it? He was pardoned by Governor Ritchie um, about 10 years later. They both went on to live happily ever after, believe it or not, a apart. She moved down to the Carolinas and he, he stayed uh, in the area. Um, but that, that you know, that was an interesting thing. Um, That's your next topic, historical fiction. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, this, yeah, this wasn't fiction, though. That was the nice thing about it is. But if you, if, you, if you carried the story, if you told right. the story. If I, if I told that story. As long as it was yeah. under the label of historical fiction and not. Yeah, I could then tell that whole story the way that I think it happened. <laughs> um, but there, there was one, one interesting thing. I, I, I should have it bookmarked here. Um, from that story and those events, and trying to do research and find out more about this guy, um, William Cronmiller. He was the one that was uh, sentenced, uh, found guilty of murder and sentenced. 
there was a find a grave. That's one of those websites that you know researchers and others can use. I mean, it's, it's not an absolute perfect source, but it's pretty good. It gives a lot of clues. You go in the find a grave, and I was looking up his find a grave and where he was buried, and there was a, you could leave a little note to somebody, like, you know, rest in peace, you leave flowers, you leave whatever onto this website. And there was a note on this website from just a couple years ago. And it said, great grandpa, what did you do? <laughs> you must have really loved that woman to kill her husband. Rest in peace. And it was like, wow, all those years, almost a hundred years later, somebody noticed and uh, you know knew about their family history and went to that. She got the history wrong. <laughs> you know, he didn't kill the hus husband. Um, and uh, you know, obviously this person didn't know that her great-grandfather was pardoned. But the power of history and this storytelling and getting things right, I would have liked her to know, <laughs> you know, somehow that, you know, don't, don't know that he really, you know, it's, it's up in the, uh, you know. Now, if you get pardoned, that doesn't necessarily mean innocence. Mm -hmm. Um, you get pardoned for other kind of reasons, um, which is a whole other story dealing with B&O issues. But, Didn't um, Spiro Agnew get pardoned? Yeah. <laughs> or uh, Nixon, yeah. No. Good Agnew service to pardon. But, um, you know, I just want to check. So I can't read that clock. It doesn't work. I want to make sure. Ah, then it wouldn't help if you could. Okay. <laughs> well, it'll be right twice a day, right? Or something. right. <laughs> but I, I think, I, I think it, it sounds like a good time for Q and A. Perfect. If you guys have, yeah, so there's one yeah. question here. Yes. Well, two Hi. questions. What was the name of that center of Howard County? And can you tell us more of the hidden things that you found? Okay, when you saw oh, the center of Howard County yeah, was, was Christ Church. Yeah, was that, was that? Yeah. Yeah, that was on Oakland Mills Road. That was Christ that big, Church, um, um, I guess. I don't know. I, I can't remember at the time if it was Episcopal. It became a, you know, it, it was, yes. It was that. And first baptisms were 1711, but the first structure was until 1727. Okay. You know, they. You, you had, you know, the Ridgeleys, the, the uh, you know, you had some Worthingtons there. You had other, um, Warfields. I'm trying to remember if the Warfields were there as well. Okay, the, yeah, they were. Uh, you, you had all of these very, very early, the earliest of families. And they were, I can't, I can't remember the term, the, the people that were um, assigned leadership roles. Um, at any rate, they had um, divided up much of the area of Howard County into things that were very similar to precincts. And those were tax collection areas, particularly for tobacco. When people were selling tobacco, um, they bring it in over to Alfred Landing. That was the primary port. And there'd be somebody from the church, whoever was you know assigned at that particular time, and um, they would collect uh, you know whatever whatever tax, and it was it was the way that people communicated and how they you know they got together at least once a week as a congregation they got together uh, more frequently for other kinds of meetings. It, it was it was a, a very very big center. Um, a lot of things. Uh, some of the things that we learned were about uh, the the education system in the schools, uh, particularly in Guilford and the Rosenwald School that was built in uh, 1923. That's still in existence. Julius Rosenwald, who was uh, 
I guess, president of uh, Sears at the time, uh, from Chicago. He was a philanthropist and wanted to fund Southern schools, and <coughs> particularly, um, you know, particularly for, for the benefit of African American children. Uh, he would provide a certain amount of funding for uh, communities that wanted to build a school. He didn't pay for the whole thing. Community had to raise some funding. The government had to raise some funding. And in Guilford, it, it was amazing is that the community raised more money than they got from the Rosenwald or from the, from the county. Um, that was kind of unusual back then. The Guilford, the black community in Guilford, it's a historically black area. They built it. Um, that was just a, a phenomenal thing. They also built, uh, you know, very, very early school, earlier, uh, right around 1905, 1906, when the Maryland Granite Company came in. There were big, big parades, big events, uh, jousting and uh, political speeches in the, what do we call them, in the 19 aughts to 19 teens? Uh, yeah, like the 19 aughts, that, yeah. that makes sense. Then it was called Guilford Day. And that was because the Maryland Granite Company was one of the biggest industries in Howard County. Oh my God, it attracted everybody. And the events they had, um, and they even played baseball. They had baseball competitions between different communities. But uh, the jousting, it, that was the whole thing. Uh, the Knights, the, I mean, they had sometimes uh, over 5,000 to 8,000 people attending these. Um, it, it was just a, a single day of competition, picnicking, fun, uh, prettiest baby contests, <laughs> all these different things. And of course, the dreaded political speeches. Um, you know, whoever was running for office, um, at that time, uh, Senator Gorman wasn't running, but his son was. He was a, a politician. Um, and again, we, we talk about that in the book. Um, yeah, well, what, other, what other hidden history? I have to look at the table. We're talking about Savage. Savage is a huge well, topic. Well, Savage. And speaking of hidden, you know, that kind of was some of the um, Jim Crow era rules. In, well, you know, de facto kind of institutional racism that occurred in Savage, the people there aren't a big fan of talking about now. Not everybody. Some people are. Some people want more of that history to be discussed, but... S Savage was a sundown town. Until the 1980s. For most of it, its existence until about the 1980s or so. Um, that is not what it is now. But it's important to recognize that. A sundown town, no black people were allowed after sundown, or else. Um, that's the way it was. It, you know, if you're allowed if you're working. There are a lot of uh, uh, washerwomen, uh, uh, maids. There, there, there were people like this, but you kind of knew that you had to be out of there at a certain time. And, you know, that was just the way that, that history was. There were a couple deeds that were you know, implemented in 19, uh, was it 1920s and uh, 1930s, saying that, you know, we'll give you this land or sell this land, but you can't have anybody with a drop of black blood living on it after, you know, that you, you can't sell it. You, you can't do anything. And that was, that was what they did. And I'm just very, very thankful that that is not what Savage is today. Um, you know, I, I encourage people all the time to go there, check it out. It's a historic mill. Mm -hmm. 1822, not 1816 as they have in some of their documents. 1816 came up because somebody found on a windowsill during reconstruction in the 1940s. Something with a name and a date penciled into a windowsill of 1816. And that all of a sudden became their big date that they want to use for their anniversaries. Uh, I'm sorry, the, you know, the land belonged to people, other people. Um, it wasn't until uh, 
the 1820s that the Savage Manufacturing Company even existed, uh, 1822, 1823, and that they started to buy the land and build. Um, the, the one thing that's remarkable when you're looking at any of the industry, in the history of the industry in this county, in the 1800s, um, and even in the early 1900s, boy, they built stuff fast. They built it, and, and they went to town on it. They got these things done in months. Uh, they built the entire railroad in, in a very short amount of time. Unbelievable effort. I, I mean, there was a lot of labor involved. Um, so by, the Savage Mill was probably built, in a, you know, started 1823. By 1825, they were having an amazing business. Um, and the same thing over here uh, for the Ellicott Mill. They really did, I mean, they just bought the land in December of, of 1722. Uh, pardon? 1772. 1772, sorry. And by 1774, they had a thriving business going already. I mean, they, they were in business, they were selling, they were merchants, they, were, they had a, a store. And, you know, one of the things I'd like to, to share in our, our next book is a little bit about the ledger from that store and the kinds of things that these people were buying. Who was buying from their store? And um, I will tell you, there was a lot of whiskey <laughs> that got sold by the other kids to everybody in the community. That was a, you know, and Maryland was, uh, had been known, and I, I don't know when that ended, as a big rye whiskey uh, state. It, it just, it, it was very, very prominent. Um, I'm still researching the origins of the name Whiskey Bottom Road. Uh, the Voices of Laurel is putting out a story I wrote about it that should be coming out any month. But I'm learning more. <laughs> and. That's the other thing. None of this research stops. It's not like, okay, here, it's done, put it on a shelf, move on. No, there, there's still questions. Um, people come up with questions. Some people come up with answers. Um, you know, things that we never considered. And it's, it's just a lot of fun. Um, it has to be fun. Um, you know, people, uh, you know, I know Jerry, you've written some uh, really nice articles about history for the, uh, for the legacy here for the uh, Howard County Historical Society. Um, and Barb here, along with her son Liam, uh, kept me going on doing the research on that cemetery. Um, you know, I'm not as sure-footed as I used to be. I think I used to be more sure-footed. Um, but it, it's really nice to have, a, you know, company, another set of eyes, and really smart people helping. I mean, people notice things that, that, that I don't. And um, anyway, that's a long window <laughs> to your basic question. Any other questions that we could answer? Yes, sir. You mentioned quite a few different kinds of sources. Which one was most helpful for you on the book? Category. Hmm. Newspapers or maps, letters? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I like, the, the reason I like newspapers, not necessarily to rely on them as pure fact, but they give you clues. Some of them are factual, some of them are reporting in the document or reporting what the government did or they might have a vote tally that'll be harder for you to get. I mean, newspapers communicated an awful lot of information. Um, and I have three different newspaper su subscriptions, <laughs> archives, um, to look at, and I check them all very frequently. Um, I found some remarkable information, believe it or not, through Google Books online, and you know, uh, one lesson I've learned is when you do an online search, you know, it comes up with the page of stuff. 
and there might be 10 or more pages. Look, go to the other pages, look. You know, there, there, there could be really, really good stuff. Change your search terms. Um, and some people have multiple spellings of the same name. Uh, look at that, I mean, it, it's just an unlimited amount. Um, I like newspapers, I like some of the books. Um, you know, right now I'm really getting into some of the B&O annual reports. Because they talk about people. They talk about people that lived here, they talk about history. And, um, you know, fortunately here in Maryland, and, and in Howard County, I mean, I mean, the first step should be the historical society. You know, if you're looking up a new, see what they have. And then you also find out what they don't have. But it gives you clues to, you know, to what you need to look at. Um, uh, yeah, I was gonna say that was gonna be my first answer is, I had a set of specific uh, archives that I went to, that I would search this place for this, that place for that. Maryland State Archives, the Howard County, the Howard County Archives, um, B and O Archives, Library of Congress, and I would just plug the same search term into all these different ones and see what what fit. And eventually, I kind of knew, all right, well, this one wouldn't have this document, but maybe it would have this. Uh, I went to the Maryland Center for History and Culture looking for something about uh, a letter that Robert Garrett wrote to the station agent of, a, of the. Uh, railroad station down there because that's where I work so everything's about there um, other than what's in here but I, I went there and then they I went got like a, several folders worth and went through it all there wasn't anything but uh, most of the other places didn't have anything so I had like a set number of archives that I had and, and would just go through those well then at the Maryland Center for History and well, it's the old Maryland Historical Society right yeah yeah. When I was doing research on Savage, on Savage Mill, there was a, a reference to a um, kind of a, a small ledger, a notebook that had belonged to a David Carroll. And David Carroll was one of, he was an apprentice at the mill, at Savage Mill, basically right when they opened. He lived in Guilford. As a matter of fact, his oldest son, who was an infant, sadly. First, I think you say. Pardon? First son. His first son. Not oldest, because he was six months when he died. Yeah, right. Well, his, his first son That's was actually like buried at the Guilford Cemetery that um, Jerry located for us, and Barb and Liam and I, and Jerry explored. You did a lot of work on that. Yeah. You, you really did. You're not, you're not taking the credit you deserve. Well, that. you know. I really needed you guys because <laughs> it, it, it was like, you know, really, uh, it was a lot of work, a lot of stress, and the encouragement was really, um, really appreciated. But that led to, who was David Carroll? Well, you know, he ended up with the uh, Woodbury uh, Mill uh, along uh, uh, Jones Falls. He was a big industrialist, along with Horatio Ambrose. They were both apprentices at the same time and then uh, at Savage and then they became business partners. What I also found about David Carroll was actually there were two graves, uh, John Carroll and Eliza Marlowe. Well John Carroll is David Carroll's brother and Eliza Marlowe was John Carroll's wife. First marriage. She was originally Eliza Isaac, the sister of the person who this cabin or log house is, I guess, still named for? Yeah. Thomas Isaac. Yeah. And, and so there was a, one of the big lessons was that even if you're just studying in Guilford, it's connected mm -hmm. to everything else in the county. People were connected, families were connected. And the state, and even more than that, I mean, in the state. Gorman, Arthur, yeah. 
Gorman, Vietnam. Gorman, Barney, Joshua Barney, who lived at, had a house in Savage, the Guilford Pirate. Thomas Lansdale, who was at Savage, he was one of the managers uh, in the, I think, uh, in the 1820s, early 30s, for um, Savage Mill. He was one of the founders of Triadelphia, which doesn't really exist anymore. Um, Horace Capron. But that would be the next Laurel, Laurel Mill and all these other things, yes. So, do we have time for one more? Uh, yeah, well, so it's just about one. Um, so, let's do one more question and then we'll wrap up. Okay. So, I was just curious how operationally you keep your information straight. Do you create computer files that you cut and paste stuff into, print it, or? Yeah. How do you keep it all straight? We Dropbox. Not that we're, uh, you know, we don't get a, what do you call it, advertising or, we're not advertising for Dropbox, but I, I love it. We use Dropbox online, and that way we can share files. We have hundreds of folders, tens of thousands of files. Um, and right now, you know, trying to keep I've got a folder for people and a folder for places, but sometimes it's the same, the, the person is the place. Right. And so I, I, I just try to keep it in one. But it's Dropbox, it's all these electronic uh, files. And, and most of that information, um, if, I, if we go to some place, like the uh, ledger for David Carroll that I found, which was really, really cool, take pictures of it. Save them either as JPEGs and turn those JPEGs into PDFs. Mm -hmm. um, however, so we, we, yeah, and you know, Mark's seen me taking you know little photos of this and that. Um, one of the great collections that they have that I love are the voter poll, the poll registration books. Uh, my, my God, I mean, it's amazing. Once you can figure out when it's basically when the start dates kind of work. You know, it tells you who was really there in which district, and where basically where they lived in the general area that they lived. It's just it's just a phenomenal collection. And um, anyway, um, yes, thank you.